happy Monday, listeners. Let's kick off the first full week of August by catching up on some science news. For Scientific American Science Quickly, I'm Rachel Feltman. Last Wednesday, researchers with the American Cancer Society published a study suggesting that for a number of cancers, case rates are rising from one generation to the next. They looked at 34 different cancers, and in eight of them, incidence rates went up with every five-year interval they looked at from 1920 to 1990. So in other words, the cohort born in 1965 had higher rates than the cohort born in 1960, but lower rates than the 1970 cohort, and so on. In another nine cancers, while rates had declined for some period of time, they started to rise again in younger cohorts recently. The researchers emphasize that they don't yet have a conclusive explanation for the trend. And while headlines often point to sedentary lifestyles and higher weights as a leading culprit, that's particularly true for a recent surge in colorectal cancers in young people, other experts have sounded the alarm to say that these factors alone cannot explain the spike. But we did get some good news on that front. Last Monday, the Food and Drug Administration approved a new blood test for colorectal cancer. Garden Health's test is called SHIELD, and it was previously available as a diagnostic tool for doctors, but its out-of-pocket price tag ran almost $900. Hopefully, now that it's FDA approved, it will be covered by more insurance carriers. SHIELD isn't a replacement for colonoscopies. Those procedures are crucial for spotting and even removing the polyps that can lead to colon cancer, and of course, for detecting cancer itself. Research suggests that the non-invasive blood test is 83% effective in catching colorectal cancer, but it works way better in late stages of the disease than in early stages. Still, we know that colonoscopies are notoriously time-consuming, partially on account of the need for bowel prep, and that's often quite an unpleasant experience. So people tend to avoid them. The hope is that this blood test will cover some of the gaps that we know exist in screening. Another recent cancer study highlighted something that we just get more and more evidence is super important, the microbiome. Scientists found that certain mouth bacteria seem to provide some benefit to people who have head and neck cancers, basically leading to better outcomes and survival rates. The researchers also found that the type of bacteria in question, which is a very common resident of the mouth called Fusobacterium, could actually outright kill some cancer cells, at least in a petri dish setting. In completely different health news, let's turn to cat poop. Most people have probably heard of Toxoplasma gondii, the parasitic protozoan that causes toxoplasmosis. The parasite reproduces in the intestinal tracts of cats and infects other mammals through contact with their fecal matter. Humans can also get it from eating raw or undercooked meat. The parasite is infamous for causing infected rodents to lose their fear of cats, which is among the freakiest things a protozoan can make an animal do. Toxoplasma gondii is also known for raising the risk of miscarriage in pregnant people. Last week, researchers published a new study suggesting the parasite could be hijacked for positive purposes. So one of the things that makes this microbe so dangerous is its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's something that's notoriously tricky to do on purpose, for example, when it comes to delivering medication. Now, this research is still very much in its early stages, but it looks like toxoplasma could potentially be engineered to deliver therapeutic proteins to the brain. The scientists had some success testing this using rodent models. Now let's flap on over to the bird flu. Listen, there's a lot of health stuff this week. I don't know what to tell you. That's just the news. Last week, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention announced a $5 million initiative to inoculate farm workers against the seasonal flu. Now, this vaccine doesn't target H5N1, which is one of the viruses that causes bird flu, which has been making headlines for spreading among U.S. cattle and to a lesser extent among humans who work with cattle. But the seasonal flu vaccine does lower the risk of catching the flu strains that are prevalent among humans. The idea is to minimize the risk of people getting a one-two punch of flu infections because it is theoretically very possible to carry around both H5N1 bird flu and a more common human strain at the same time. When viruses cohabitate inside a living host, they get the chance to swap genetic material. 
the concern is that if H5N1 spends time cozying up with a flu strain that's really good at infecting people, we might see it mutate into a strain that's able to hop from one person to another, which right now it does not seem able to do. Only around half of the U.S. population actually tends to get the seasonal flu jab. I know, it's really low. You should get your flu shot this year. So this kind of intervention really could make a difference. Still, some folks are arguing that the U.S. should also be vaccinating farm workers against H5N1 itself, which is what Finland's government reportedly plans to do. CDC officials say they're still weighing the pros and cons. Okay, that's enough healthy stuff for us for one day. Let's enjoy a little junk food by talking about private space flight. SpaceX is set to send billionaire entrepreneur Jared Isaacman on the first ever private spacewalk, but they're not quite as set as either had hoped. Funded by Isaacman, the Polaris Dawn mission was originally slated to launch on SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft in 2022, and the company had recently said liftoff could happen as soon as last Wednesday. But during a July 26 press conference, SpaceX pushed the launch to sometime in mid to late August. Hopefully everyone involved is, you know, diving into a pool of money Scrooge McDuck style to make themselves feel better about it. Finally, we're used to hearing about the discovery of new planets, the discovery of new species, etc. But what about new wood? Yeah, scientists say they found just that, a new kind of wood. What a time to be alive. So generally, when we talk about wood types, because this is not something I knew before writing the script today, we draw the line between hardwood and softwood. This isn't necessarily a reference to the wood's actual density, like I always thought it was. Hardwoods generally come from trees that have flowers and seasonal changes in their leaves, while softwoods generally come from conifers. In a new study, scientists took a nanoscale look at the two surviving species of the Liriodendron genus, the tulip tree and the Chinese tulip tree, and they found wood that didn't quite fit the mold. This so-called midwood structure could help explain why the trees grow so quickly and are so good at capturing carbon. Understanding that mechanism might help scientists select the best trees for carbon sequestration, and perhaps even engineer plants that are better suited for the job. That's all for this week's News Roundup. We'll be back on Wednesday with a slightly bigger bite of science news for you to chew on. And don't forget to tune in on Friday for the last installment in our ongoing fascination miniseries all about the wildest kinds of archaeology research. If you're enjoying the show, do us a favor and leave a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also send us questions, comments, and suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover at sciencequickly at siam.com. Science Quickly is produced by me, Rachel Feltman, along with Fonda Mwangi, Kelso Harper, Madison Goldberg, and Jeff Delvisio. Shayna Posis and Aaron Shattuck fact-check our show. Our theme music was composed by Dominic Smith. Subscribe to Scientific American for more up-to-date and in-depth science news. For Scientific American, this is Rachel Feltman. Have a great week.